Hi, I'm Mass Sergeant Joe Martell. I uh, just returned from Afghanistan, and I'm in Brussels. Uh, surprised my son during his football game. We don't often expect the unexpected. Uh, if you've ever done that where you ran into a glass thinking it was a door, you don't expect the glass to stop you. If you've ever had someone startle you, you don't expect someone to jump out of places that they're not supposed to be, and you don't expect a opponent to be your father who's just come home. And we don't expect the dead to be alive. We don't expect the weak to be strong. But we have come to know as followers of Jesus, if you follow him, that sometimes we have to expect the unexpected. And so this morning we're going to look at John's account, or his recollection of Jesus raising the dead. So if you've got Bibles or a smart device the Bible app, we're going to be in John chapter 20. If you didn't bring one with you, it's not a big deal. We have these underneath the chair. I invite you to reach down, grab one of those, and follow along with us. If you came here this morning and you don't have a Bible at your house that's easy for you to read and understand, reach down, grab the one that's near you under your chair, follow along with us this morning, then take Take it with you, gift from us to you, because we want everyone to have a Bible that's easy for them to read and to understand. But we're going to be in John chapter 20, and we're going to read a big chunk of it. We'll break it up in a couple sections, uh, but we're going to first start at the very beginning of John chapter 20, verse 1. Before we go, can we pause and let's pray? Let's just ask God that he will help us understand uh, what happened that awesome day. Kind Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for each person that's here. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together to celebrate the unexpected. What was dead came back to life. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice, but also thank you for raising from the dead to defeat that in us. Teach us this morning. Help us to grasp at a deeper level who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 20, verse 1 says this. Early, first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter the, and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. Let's pause there. Okay, so the book of this, this part of the Bible is written by somebody, and we believe it's the one whose name uh, has it written in the book. And so who would that be? We read in the book of what? So we think it's John. My guess is it had to be John. And when you look at this, I think he considers himself the one that Jesus loved. I mean, isn't that typical manhood right there? I'm not going to write my name in here, but I'm just going to write some other things that let you know it's me, the one Jesus loved. And then I'm going to let you know that I am faster than Peter. And so that when we ran and the race was on, I won. And so here we have this scenario. They did not expect him to be alive. But there they come and they find an empty tomb. An empty tomb? Once you put someone in, they're supposed to stay there. An empty tomb? I mean, these people, they'd only seen one other person raised from the dead. That was a man named Lazarus, and guess who did that? Jesus. And now he's the one that's dead. What's going on here? Let's keep reading, verse 10. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white, 
seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Where have you put him? Oh, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. So we we don't expect the dead to become alive, and we don't expect the weak to be strong. Who does Jesus choose to reveal himself to first? This woman named Mary. We don't know a whole bunch about Mary, but what we do know of Mary was that Mary had a troubled past. We know that at one point, Jesus cast seven demons out of her, and so she had a troubled past, and she is the one that Jesus chooses to reveal himself to first after rising from the dead. We don't expect the dead to become alive, and we don't expect the weak to be strong. But God is all about doing the unexpected. We know their location, and the location of this tomb is in a garden. The reason that I do that, I use my deducing skills, because she believes that Jesus is the gardener. And so we know it's in a garden. We don't know what type of garden. We don't know much about the garden. But we know that it's in the garden that Jesus steps out of the tomb, resurrected from the dead. I find this very interesting. In a different garden, at the very beginning of time, everything was lost. Sin and death entered into the world. And it's in a different garden, much, much later, that it all begins to be won back, and the power of sin and death is broken. (coughs) Excuse me. If you don't know about that first garden, if you read in the book of Genesis, God created this place called Eden, and it was perfect, absolutely perfect. And he placed humanity inside there. And in there, somehow, we don't know how, a talking snake got there. Does that seem weird to you? (laughs) Why is there a talking snake in the garden? But there is. We don't know why. We just know that there's a talking snake in the garden. And this talking snake, as we go through the story, we learn that it is there for a purpose, and that is in rebellion to God, trying to convince people against the goodness of God. Have them doubt the goodness of God. And he starts to whisper into the ears of the people in the garden, saying, God's really not that good. He's trying to hold you down. Eat the fruit he told you not to eat. And in that, humanity is tricked by the talking snake. And they eat the fruit. And brokenness enters into our world because they doubted the goodness of God. You would think the story would be over right there. But God is always about doing the unexpected. And so we start to march through this story. And it's a long story, but we'll march through some of the high points. He starts to work with one person named Abraham and says, Through Abraham, through your family, I'm going to return goodness and blessing to the land. I'm going to return goodness and blessing to the earth. And so through Abraham and his descendants, he starts to work this plan. And through one of his grandkids, he begins to give this promise. He says, come on out of you will be a king who will rule in my place and will return this goodness and this perfection back to this world. And so everyone starts looking forward to this king. And we get to a man named David, the first king coming from this line. And we think, is it him? Is he the one? But we find out that David also has been impacted and infected by this evil, and it wraps around him, and it begins to drag him down, and he's not the one that does this thing. Back in that garden, after they messed up, there's this really, really weird thing that God tells him. He looks at the woman, and he looks at the snake, the talking snake, and he says to him, he said, your kids, your ancestors, they're going to have a problem with each other. And at some point, the descendant of the serpent's going to bite the heel, and the descendant of the humanity is going to crush the snake. 
And it's almost like this double blow happens. Lethal double blow, biting the heel, but also the crushing of the snake. And so for all of time, it's like, who's going to be this snake crusher? Is it David? No, he's been impacted by evil, and he doesn't happen. And so we start looking at every king after him. Is it going to be this king? Is it going to be this king? And what we find out is that the kings don't get better. They actually get worse. More and more impacted by evil and things that begin to plague them. Lust, greed, worshiping other idols. And they go in such a direction, they finally run this whole thing into the ground, and the nation of Israel that Abraham started or was a part of is now no longer. It's like, where is this king going to come from now? It looks lost. It looks hopeless. But God's about doing the unexpected. And so there's this group of people called prophets. They're kind of weird. And they start saying these predictions. Hey, don't forget, this is coming. It's still coming. It's still coming. It's still coming. It's still coming. In the midst of all the hopelessness, they're saying, have hope, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And one of them says, named Isaiah, he says, there's this one that's going to come, he's a king, and he's going to die because of the evilness of humanity. Hmm. Might this one be the snake crusher? And we fast forward from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're introduced to Jesus. The one that came from heaven, we're introduced to Jesus as a king, as the one that's going to look to crush the snake. But on Good Friday, we see the fatal blow from evil against Jesus. And it looks like for a couple days that evil has won. But then comes Easter morning. And that fatal blow from the human to the serpent has happened as Jesus walks out of the tomb fully alive. And so in that moment, in the garden, he has broken the power of sin. He's broken the power of death. Does it mean it all goes away? Absolutely not. You've looked around our world and you've seen it still. But what it means is that the power that holds us trapped, that says we have to do evil, that we have to go away from God, that has been broken, and now we don't have to participate in that. We can be committed to, wholly submitted to God. That has been broken forever. And what Jesus does is now, because of that, he has the power to break that evilness inside of us. And those who are impacted him then have the power to share their story in the love of Jesus with others that can break that power in them. I'm not a gardener. I don't even play one on TV. Like, I, I'm not. I'm not. It, part of it goes back to my childhood. We had a huge garden when I was a kid, and before I could play in the summer, I had to weed two rows of the garden, and, like, that scarred me for life. Like, I love to eat the stuff, but I hate the work of it all. So I, I'm not a gardener, but I took ecology in college, and so I understand how it works, all right? And so, like, I, I love fruit. I love vegetables. I even love flowers. I think they're beautiful. And I know that they are here and that they are life and that because we eat them, they give us life because something else died. The fruit died to give seed, other things died to make fertilizer, to make nutrients in that soil so that something else new could grow and be alive. The same thing happened with humanity. Jesus died so that we could have life. The unexpected. We don't expect the dead to be alive. We don't expect the weak to be strong. But because of Jesus, he is back alive. And because of that, you and me, the weak, can become strong, not because of how good we are, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Because he broke the power of sin and death, we no longer have to be strangleholded that, by those things. Because he has done that work for us, now we can step into his goodness, we can step into his rightness, and we can follow him and be alive with him. And in that, God then can use us, you, me, simple people, nothing special about us, 
but we have a story of what Jesus has done to us once we get to know him and once we turn our life over to him. And because we have a story, we can share that story with others, and when we share that story with others, it can help them recognize their need for God in their life, and it can change them. See, all the way back in the beginning, when the garden, when it looked like it was hopeless, God declared a revolution. God declared a revolution all the way back then. He declared a revolution that he was going to get back what was lost and that he was going to defeat what had broken this mess. And every moment in the steps of history have been steps forward and backwards in this revolution. But the one declarative moment in the revolution when was Jesus walked out of a tomb. And when he walked out of a tomb, it was a whole new world and the revolution took a big, giant step forward. We today still are a part or have a possibility to be a part of the revolution of God to push back the darkness and to store what it was, this place, in goodness, in blessing, and in rightness. After Mary realizes it's Jesus, in verse 17, Jesus says to her, Do not hold on to me. For I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said, or he had said these things to her. One day, we don't know when, one day Jesus will return. He will return. In all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his awe and wonder, he will return. And in that moment, he will make everything right again, the way it was at the very beginning. Perfect, good, right. So what do we do until then? Do we twiddle our thumbs and wait? Do we bunker down and hide, hoping that this sin stuff, this evil stuff doesn't infect us once again? What do we do? I don't think so. Because Jesus' death is the death that brings life to others. But it's not the only one. You see, we too are invited into a death. What? Not very appetizing, Pastor. What you doing there? Inviting me to die. No, thank you. Not today. No. No. Not a physical one, but that death of that life where I get to set the course, where I'm in charge, where I get to do whatever I want to do. Because of Jesus' death, he invites us to die to that so that we can live with him and we can live for him. And when we live for him, he does this crazy thing. He makes the weak strong and he makes the unusable usable. And he uses us to impact others. And the power of sin and death can be broken in others, and the revolution can keep going. When we teach here at Hope Community Church, we ask three questions. What did you hear? How can you respond? Who can you share it with? And so sometimes I leave it very vague. Sometimes I give some, pretty, some decent instruction. But what we're asking in these three questions is, I believe that any time we gather together, any time we turn our attention to God, that he speaks. And that when he speaks, he wants us to hear him. And so maybe something in this story, maybe something this morning has kind of gripped you a little bit stronger or can, kind of made you think, or it has said, huh, I hadn't thought about that before. Maybe it was the fact that in the garden it was lost and now in another garden it was all won back. Maybe it was the fact that God didn't just raise from the dead so that I can have a good life, but invited me to be a part of a revolution of trying to change this world and push back the darkness. Whatever it is, I believe that's what God wants you to hear this morning. And when God speaks, when he speaks to us, he wants us to also respond to him. And so if what you are hearing this morning, you can put that into words, what would be an appropriate response to that? The third question is, who can I share it with? Very simple reason why we share things. 
One, it helps the truth go out. There's a big group here this morning, but the truth can go out to more and more and more people. Second part is anytime I have to tell someone else what God is sharing with me, I really have to let that sink deeper inside me, chew it up a little bit more, so that I'm able to put it into words that make sense for somebody else. And so while it also spreads, it also goes deeper inside of me. And so what are some things that we might respond to God with? Maybe this morning, you're hearing this news and you're recognizing that you don't have this in your life. That you don't have this freedom, you don't have this goodness, you don't have this joy that comes with Jesus. And you're like, huh, I want that. So how do you respond? Die. Die so that you can live. Die to the way you've been doing things, which is keeping you from the goodness of God, which is keeping you from enjoyment in life. And try God's way allowing him to be the one that sets the course and sets the trajectory. Maybe you say, I've, I've already done that. How can I respond? Well, the response for you might be this. Join the revolution to bring life to others. Join the unexpected revolution, the one that comes not from out of power, but out of sacrifice. The one that comes when live or dead things are made life and weak things are made strong. And join the revolution by doing certain things, by sharing with other people what Jesus has done for you, by encouraging people because there's not enough of that going around here, by serving people and helping so that they get a taste of the goodness of Jesus even before they understand fully who he is. It's not a challenging or a complex life, but it does demand everything from us. But I promise you, it's the best life that you could ever have. I think the perfect example for us and the best way to respond is through communion. And so our ushers, I invite you to go ahead and prepare right now uh, the communion elements. The reason why I believe this is such a great way to respond to God is because what happened with the communion elements? It would have been Thursday night, we think. The night, last Jesus night, he had dinner with his disciples. They were having a set Passover meal, but in it, he took it a little bit of a turn. And he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus willingly was going to allow himself to be broken for us. And then he takes the cup and he says, this cup is a new relationship, new covenant between the Father and you, and it's going to be sealed by the shedding of my blood. And so it wasn't just death for death's sake. It wasn't just death because he'd done something wrong. It was a death that was going to, because it broke the power of sin and death, reopen a channel up from us to God and a relationship that could be renewed and restored. And so, as we come here this morning to celebrate Easter, we celebrate that his body was broken, that his blood was poured out for us, so that the power of sin and death in us could be broken, and so that our trajectory of life could be changed, that we could join the revolution to make a difference in this place, and to see his goodness, and to see his rulership expand around this place until the day he comes back. And so, many of us have done this often, eat the bread, drink the juice. This morning, maybe for some of us, it's a little bit different because we are recognizing our need to die so that we can live. And these acts right here are not just simple actions, but you're recognizing that God's presence is with us and that he's doing something here for you and you are saying yes to him. I invite you to receive communion with us in that way. For some of us, it's recognizing that it doesn't just stop with me saying yes to Jesus, but to join the revolution with him, to share what he's done for me with other people. And so as you eat the bread and as you drink the cup, you recognize that it's not just for you, but it's death so that others can bring life. And so this morning, as we respond, this is a way for us to respond to God, to make commitments in here that will make a difference out there in the rest of our life and to see his goodness continue to move.
Community at Hope Community Church is open to anyone who follows Jesus. You don't have to be a member of this church if this is your very first time here. Uh, we still welcome you to receive communion. If you follow Jesus, you're welcome to. Our ushers are going to come forward in a minute, and they're going to pass down a couple plates. One will have cups of juice, one will have little wafers. Go ahead and grab one of each of those. Hold on to it. Uh, our band's going to be leading us through a song during that time. Once everyone gets their communion elements and, uh, and the ushers back in place, then I'll come back up and I'll invite us to receive those elements together. Let me pray as we begin. God and Father, we thank you that you are a God of the unexpected. That when hopelessness, when death, when everything that was evil looked like it was going to win, you sent Jesus. And when death thought it had beat Jesus, you raised him from the dead. And Lord, I thank you that we are Easter people and that you are still raising people from the dead and that you are still breaking the power of sin and death in our lives and freeing us from that so that we can be yours and that we can serve you. As we receive these elements, for some, it's some, going to be something different. It's saying yes to you. And we thank you for what you're doing this morning. For some, it's going to be recognizing that their life is going to change from now on as they join the revolution and see themselves as part of a movement to restore your goodness and perfection here one life at a time. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. And we ask that you would forgive us and that you would empower us so that we can truly be yours and be used.